This audio production was made in collaboration with Audible Anarchist. Fighting for Ourselves Anarcho-Syndicalism and the Class Struggle by Solidarity Federation Introduction Against the offensive of capital and politicians of all hues, all the revolutionary workers of the world must build a real international association of workers, in which each member will know that the emancipation of the working class will only be possible when the workers themselves, in their capacities as producers, manage to prepare themselves in their economic organizations to take possession of the land and the factories and enable themselves to administer them jointly in such a way that they will be able to continue production and social life. Statutes of the International Workers Association one must try to increase, as much as possible, the theoretical content of all our activities, which could destroy, in part, the great constructive action which our comrades are carrying forward in the relentless fight between the haves and the have-nots. Our people stand for action on the march. It is while going forward that we overtake. Don't hold them back, even to teach them, quote, the most beautiful theories. Francisco Escaso the spirit of anarcho-syndicalism is characterized by independence of action around a basic set of core principles, centered on freedom and solidarity. Anarcho-syndicalism has grown and developed through people taking action, having experiences, and learning from them. The idea is to contribute to new and more effective action, from which we can collectively bring about a better society more quickly. That is the spirit of anarcho-syndicalism. Self-Education Collective. As we write this in 2012, capitalism is experiencing one of its periodic crises. In Britain, the Depression is now longer than the so-called Great Depression of the 1930s. The state is seizing the opportunity to tear up past working-class gains across the board. From healthcare provision and reproductive rights, to unemployment, disability welfare and access to higher education, from job security to wages. This has provoked brief moments of intense defensive struggles. In the winter of 2010, students took to the streets across the country against the tripling of tuition fees to £9,000 per year. The movement erupted in November with the trashing of the ruling Conservative Party HQ in Millbank as thousands broke away from the official National Union of Students march. That spirit continued throughout the following few months, with rowdy demonstrations across the country. The state response was brutal, with riot police suppressing the protesters and kettling thousands for hours in freezing conditions. The rioting in central London was, at the time, the worst in a generation. But more was to come. Meanwhile, the public sector unions slowly moved into action, calling a series of one-day strikes. Unity lasted for just two days of action before unions started dropping out and signing deals with the government, and the tangible feeling of power and possibility has been steadily demobilized into one of inevitable defeat as workers are divided by those supposed to represent their interest. In August 2011, riots once again broke out across the country. This time, they followed the police shooting and subsequent cover-up of an unarmed man in Tottenham, North London. Hatred of the police proved a common bond. Rival gangs declared truces, and over four days rioting and looting spread across the capital, and then across the country. Rioters voiced anger at police brutality and harassment, political corruption, and the rich, only for the government, media, and much of the left to dismiss them as apolitical. The riots died down, but much of the underlying tension remains. So then... We are living in times of unprecedented attacks on our living conditions on all fronts, of rising social tensions and sometimes violent eruptions of class conflict. And yet, if anything, the surprise is not that there have been riots and the odd strike, but that there have been so few. How are we to make sense of this? How are we to fight back, to take the initiative? Against this society, what do we put in its place? The 20th century discredited state socialism, and rightly so, but with it a whole history of international class struggle, 
of revolutions and counter-revolutions, victories and defeats, spontaneous uprisings and vast workers' organizations, has been eclipsed too. This pamphlet aims to recover some of that lost history in order to set out a revolutionary strategy for the present conditions. We focus on the forgotten side of the historic workers' movement, not in search of blueprints, but inspiration. We draw that inspiration from those tendencies which focus not on capturing state power through elections or insurrection in order to impose socialism from above, but took seriously the idea that the emancipation of the working class is the task of the workers themselves, posing working class direct action against the double yoke of capital and the state. We focus on anarcho-syndicalism, the tradition we come from, but touch on numerous other lesser-known radical currents along the way. We certainly don't think we have all the answers, but we do think we're at least asking the right kind of questions. How can we oppose the attacks of both capital and the state when dominant liberal and leftist approaches see the state as the protector of our, quote, rights and push for participation in the parliamentary process? What kind of society are we fighting for? if not one ruled by the impersonal forces of capital and the violence and hierarchy of the state. We see revolutionary theory as an aid to organizing workers' struggle, and not, as is so often the case, as a means of dominating and controlling it, or of producing dense and enigmatic tomes to establish one's credentials as a, quote, thinker. As capitalism is dynamic, so must be the methods we use as workers to fight it, it is only through our collective immersion in day-to-day -day struggles that we can adapt and change tactics to meet changing conditions. And as our tactics change and develop, so must our ideas. Doing and thinking are but moments of the same process of organization. It is through our involvement in our daily struggles that, as an anarcho-syndicalist union initiative, we are able to ensure that revolutionary theory keeps pace with practical realities, and remains relevant to the workers' movement and to our everyday lives. Anarcho-syndicalism is a term which trips awkwardly off the English-speaking tongue, and tends to elicit either bafflement or images of burly working men in some 19th century factory. In French, the term syndicat, in Spanish, sindicato, in Italian, sindicato, simply means union an association of workers without any further connotations, which can be modified by adjectives, such as anarcho, much as we use adjectives to modify the word union in English, trade union, craft union, industrial union, and so on. Perhaps a better translation would be anarcho-unionism, but again, in the context of the United Kingdom, unionist, has British nationalist connotations completely at odds with the working-class internationalism of the anarcho-syndicalist tradition. So we stick with the term, and unless otherwise specified, we will use it interchangeably with revolutionary unionism throughout this pamphlet. There are other advocates of revolutionary unions, which we will also encounter along the way. This pamphlet aims to shed light on both the forms and content of anarcho-syndicalist theory and practice, and in the process to dispel some of the more common myths and misapprehensions. It will explore how anarcho-syndicalist ideas have differed and adapted to meet changing conditions, outline the relationship with other traditions and anarcho-syndicalist criticisms of them. We will bring things up to date with the analysis of the post-World War II world and the conditions for organizing today. We will set out our view as an organization of what a new revolutionary unionism would look like, and outline practical steps and strategies to make it a reality. With the continued defeats workers are experiencing through the trade unions, a revolutionary alternative is needed more than ever. Indeed, we should not be asking the question, how can a union be anti-capitalist and anti-state, but rather, how can any union that is not so advance our class interests when those interests are inimical to those of capital and state? The structure of the pamphlet is as follows. Chapter 1 introduces the mainstream workers' movement, specifically trade unions and workers' parties, in both their Marxist-Leninist and Labor Party forms. 
While these have their origins in the 19th century, they continue to dominate the workers' movement such as it is today. Therefore, the analysis is not purely historical, but continues up to the present day. Chapter 2 then explores the radical currents in the 20th century workers' movement, long forgotten to most, but still a point of reference for many discontented with the limits of the mainstream. This section explores council communism, a dissident Marxist tradition that still forms an important point of reference for many of those critical of the existing trade unions, as well as Marxists breaking with party politics. It also looks at both anarchist and syndicalist traditions, providing the context for Chapter 3. With the scene then set, Chapter 3 will introduce anarcho-syndicalism as a fusion of the anarchist and syndicalist currents. We will see how this fusion took different forms in different places in response to different conditions, and explore some of the internal debates within the movement which remain relevant to our time. We will also look at the Spanish Revolution of 1936, which was both a high and low point for anarcho-syndicalism, and reflect on what went wrong and the implications for anarcho-syndicalist theory and practice. Finally, this chapter will draw on the historical discussions so far to set out the theoretical and practical basis of anarcho-syndicalism and its relation to other traditions. We will see that anarcho-syndicalism is a practice of trial and error around the political-economic core, combining the ideas and goals of anarchism with the organized labor strategy of syndicalism. Given that the anarcho-syndicalist movement was all but wiped out by the combination of fascism, repression, and total war from 1939 onwards, Chapter 4 will explore the changes in post-World War II capitalism and assess their implications for anarcho-syndicalist organizing. Specifically, we will look at the post-war social democratic settlement, which sought to counter the threat of revolution and marginalize radical currents by integrating the working class, via the trade unions, into capitalist society through a series of reforms. We will then look at how this settlement went into crisis from the end of the 1960s through the 1970s, with the wave of worker struggles against capitalism, the state, and the trade unions. But we will see how these struggles were ultimately defeated and gave way to the neoliberal counter-revolution from the late 1970s, which has dominated global capitalism ever since. Finally, Chapter 5 will draw on the analysis of contemporary conditions to assess the relevance of anarcho-syndicalism today. We will look at how to move from small political propaganda groups towards functioning revolutionary unions, explore the role of the revolutionary union, and its means of organizing class conflicts within the wider working class. We will also look at how the everyday activities of the revolutionary union relate to the revolutionary struggle for social transformation, and explore the significance of the insurrectionary general strike in the overthrow of capital and state in their replacement by worldwide libertarian communism, a stateless society based on the principle from each according to their abilities to each according to their needs, against the fashionable and market-driven disdain for anything old-fashioned we will show how anarcho-syndicalism represents a simple yet sophisticated and adaptable weapon for the working class today. And thus, why we are proud to nail our colors, red and black, to the mast of the Anarcho-Syndicalist International Workers Association. This has been a production of Audible Anarchist. You can find more Audible Anarchist on YouTube.